I'm JJ Harpster. I'm head of the science reference section uh, here at the Library of Congress. I'm also your moderator tonight uh, for our panel. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the event, um, inspired by the book release, American Feast, Cookbooks and Cocktails from the Library of Congress Collections. This book is part of, a, of the publishing office new clo collection close-up series that invites readers to experience the library's treasures in a compact, accessible book that curates a unique collection of objects and brings them to life with color reproductions, historical context, and fascinating anecdotes. So um, earlier this evening, and it's still going on upstairs, uh, the library specialists and curators and archivists treated us to a really special, um, tr a very special display um, that showed the variety and depth of the library's food collections with a focus on recipes and cookery and cocktails and, of course, cookbooks um, that were featured in American Feast. And so it's always really special to um, experience these works firsthand and in person. And um, I always learned so much from our curators, and I hope you did too. Um, it's also a really special treat to have this wonderful panel tonight. Um, and we're gonna talk about food and cooking and how it relates to history and, and everyday life and, and culture. Um, food is, is pretty much everything. <laughs> uh, we need it to live. So I'm going to introduce the panel, uh, some very short introductions. Uh, seated next to me is Joan Nathan. She is a renowned food writer and cookbook author of 11 cookbooks, including, including her latest work, King Solomon's Table, a culinary exploration of Jewish cooking from around the world. Uh, this was released by Alfred P. Knopf in April 2017. Her 1994 cookbook, Jewish Cooking America, won both the James Beard Award for the Best American Cookbook um, and as well as the IACP Julia Child Cookbook of the Year Award. Um, I am personally a big fan of her 2010 book, and I've told her that tonight, uh, Quiches, Kugels, and Couscous, uh, My Search for Jewish Food in France. Uh, this book takes the reader on this absolutely amazing culinary journey, and it also teaches you the history of the Jewish communities in France. It's, it's an excellent book. <laughs> Um, in 2015, uh, Les Dames de Coffier awarded Joan the prestigious Grand Dame, an award recognizing achievements in the, in the uh, food industry. So the previous, achievement, uh, previous recipients of this prize include Julia Child, uh, MFK Fisher, Edna Lewis, uh, Marcella Hazan, and Alice Waters, all of whom, like Joan, are featured in the American Feast book. Uh, next to Joan is uh, Peter Pastain, a uh, chef and owner of Two Amy's Pizza in Washington, D.C. Peter has long championed implementing local ingredients and the transformative and artisan techniques of foods like bread and vinegar and charcuterie. Uh, he, opened up, he also opened up a restaurant in 1987 uh, in DuPont Circle, Obelisk. Um, and in 2013, Edo on 14th Street. Um, and Peter also, this is wonderful, um, because I'm a big uh, fan of vermouth. <laughs> Peter also makes Italian-inspired small batch vermouths and aperitivos. Um, and joining uh, Peter and Joan is uh, Zach Klitzman and Susan Rayburn, authors of The American Feast. Uh, Zach is a writer and editor in the Library of Congress Publishing Office and a former Jeopardy champion. So you might have recognized his face. <laughs> I knew I knew him from somewhere. <laughs> um, and Susan is a senior writer editor in the library's publishing office. Uh, she's also the author of Rosa Parks in her own words, Football Nation, 400 Years of America's Game, and co-author of Baseball Americana, Treasures from the Library of Congress. Um, so now that those introductions are done, I am going to sit down. And I'm going to start the conversation. Um, and I'm gonna start it um, with something that all of us have, um, and that is food memory. Um, the taste, the smell, 
right? The texture, the act of preparing food uh, triggers memory um, to a specific person, a specific time, a specific place. And being in science, I'm very interested in this. Um, and scientists have continued to, to research this connection with food and memory, and they've discovered in the hippocampus uh, that, the, that your brain recognizes smell and has emotion, like it, it connects with emotion. Um, so scientists continue to research food and memory. Uh, so I thought I would ask the panel um, to talk about a food memory. And it could be something uh, that's good or bad. It doesn't have to be positive. It could be negative. It could be offbeat. It could be nostalgic. Um, it could really be anything, dealer's choice. Um, should we start with Joan or Susan? I know Susan, you want to start? OK. OK. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to go with my um, only contribution to a cookbook. When I was five, when our kindergarten class put together a cookbook, my contribution was how to make noodles, and which was my favorite food at the time. And it was a two-step process. Break the pasta and then put them in water. And it's a recipe I still follow. <laughs> and I, I love that memory. <laughs> Zach, and then we'll get to Joan. Uh, sure. I guess I'll, I'll share two things. First is that I'm sure many of you are similar in that certain foods elicit, elicit certain memories, kind of maybe the opposite. For example, anytime I have horseradish, regardless of what it's with, I immediately think of Passover seders um, and the bitterness of it. Um, and then in terms of maybe a specific memory, um, we were just discussing the other day that scientists believe that often sweet food memories are the strongest because your brain rewards, you know, you're rewarding yourself in some ways with sweets. And so your brain's more likely to remember that than maybe a spicy or bitter or um, pungent food. And so a, a sweet food memory I have, no pun intended, um, when I was young, I, when my family would visit my grandparents, often my grandfather would take me into town early in the morning. We'd go to a bakery and get fresh made donuts. And as much as I love Dunkin' Donuts or what have you, a fresh, Homemade, almost homemade donut is just so incredible, and I can still kind of picture them and, and, and taste them almost. Yum. Okay, Joan. I was going to do ladies first, but we'll do Okay. <laughs> well, I have so many food memories. <laughs> um, I'll tell you food memories. Well, I, I, can I tell you the memory of the Library of Congress yeah. instead? Yeah. Okay. Since I, I do remember food memory, my mother used to make something called Svechkenkuchen which was a plum pie um, with, a, with a butter crust. It was called a Merbetide crust. And whenever I see it, I remember the way that she would put the plums in the tart, carefully placing them, and that she did that as carefully as she remembered her mother, who never cooked. She had a cook cook. But her mother would sew, she was a, a hat maker, would sew hats. And she did that, she said, as carefully. So now when I not so carefully make it, I always think of my mother who was very careful in making it. But should I talk about the lamp? Yeah. Oh, please. all right. Do you mind? Yes, please. Uh, OK. Well, I just want to tell you that I feel really good being here. Because when I first moved to Washington 45 years ago, and I was working on my first cookbook, my second cookbook, The Jewish Holiday Kitchen, I spent a lot of time here. And I felt so awed. They didn't have the Madison building, I don't think, then. And I would come in here, and then I would go up to the, I, I think I could go up then to the Hebraic division that was over there. Right. And then I would look in there, and then they would let me go down to the, Big stacks. The, the stacks, and, and on my birthday, I would always, for several years, and I realize now that I've got in illegally, um, somebody <laughs> from the Hebraic section would let me in, and I would just happily sit in the stacks looking at all these cookbooks. And for me, that was the best birthday present. But a better birthday present was the help that I got then and that I get now from people like JJ and the two of you, they are amazing from, for my articles for the New York Times, for my books. I, I always say that it's my 
special, um, what's it, my secret speciality is, is getting these, speech, I guess, special ingredient. Yes, librarians. Anyway, but that's, I'm sorry, for, <laughs> but I couldn't help but stay it. Yeah. Peter, do you have a food memory offbeat? Nostalgic. Um, He's the opposite negative. of Negative. <laughs> I do have some negative food memories. <laughs> I do, I have too. a lot of negative food I memories. I do, too. Some of them I'm not allowed to talk about. Okay. I mean, the problem with food memories is it's really about Proust and Madeleines. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I grew up on Twinkies, so you can't really go down that road. But my great-grandmother was a really terrific baker. Um, and one of her specialties was strudel. Um, my grandmother was a terrible baker, but thought she was a good baker. Right. Um, <laughs> so when she turned... It was either 95 or 100. I decided I'd make strudel for her. Right. Um, which, you know, once you get the dough down, it isn't really that complicated. Um, so, you know, I spent a day at work. I made strudel. She lived in outside of Boston. Had to fly up to, you know, Winthrop to bring her the strudel. She had a party. She opened the box. She looked at the strudel. She said, Peter, the strudel's too thick. <laughs> right. I mean, that way, not right. dough-wise. Right. So, right. So that's how yeah. my family is about food. Yeah. <laughs> but wait yeah. a minute, but pizza? No, no nostalgia about pizza? I, mean, I used to go to Shakey's when I was a kid. Shakey's. Um, I went on the I Pike, later became a Hooters. Oh. Um, just a small factoid. Yes. Um, yeah. I know I had a birthday party once where my parents called the wrong Shakey's, so when we got there, there wasn't any uh. pizza. Um, yes. Yeah, just yeah. bad food memories. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, ha I also have sweet food memories, um, but they're, they're mainly the, the act of preparing those homemade goods that I remember most, so not really the food itself, though I do remember the food was delicious. So my mom would make me chocolate souffles. Um, I'm an only child and was terribly spoiled. And if you know how to make a souffle, it's very difficult. <laughs> um, and so she had many failures. Um, but I wanted a chocolate souffle, <laughs> damn it. Um, and so she would. And sometimes there were some really great successes. So it wasn't really the, the taste, but it, this, the chocolate, the act of her, like, don't open that oven. You know, like, you ha if you open it, the souffle will fall. Um, so I just remember the act, those, the kind of act of making a pie with, with my uncle or making cookies with my friends. And so it's not really the, the food itself, it was that act of preparing it. But it's sweets. It's all around <laughs> sweets for me. <laughs> okay, um, so moving on. Um, so, and I'm going to leave time for a question and answer. Um, and I want to keep track of that to give you guys at least, like, 20 minutes or more for, I'm sure you guys have questions uh, for our guests. Uh, so the American Feast book uh, features, oh yes, the American Feast book features all sorts of cookbooks and recipes um, from the 18th century to today. Uh, so I thought we would talk about uh, cookbooks and recipes. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with Peter. Peter, as a chef, um, how do you use or maybe not use cookbooks um, in your professional or even personal life? Um, well, differently now than I used to. So when I first started cooking, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I compulsively read a lot of cookbooks, um, you know, partially just to figure out how to do things. Unfortunately, there was a lot of really terrible information in a lot of cookbooks. Right. So you had to sort of wade through that to try and figure out how to really do things. Um, I mean, these days it's more for atmospherics, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really look at recipes, but some people are great writers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I go, you know, I compulsively reread my favorite cookbooks, mm -hmm. um, you know, pretty frequently, mm -hmm. so. And he told me upstairs you weren't allowed to buy any more cookbooks? Well, um, we don't have any more shelf space <laughs> at oh, home. Oh, shelf space for cookbooks. Right. So right, I think okay. it's sort of maybe if I buy a new one, I have to get rid of an old one. Right. Yeah. One in, one out. One in, one out. Yeah. Right. Same in my family. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a question for Joan. Okay. Um, as a food writer and a cookbook author who does probably the most outstanding, amazing job of providing readers 
with the historical context of, of the foods and recipes in your books and ingredients as well. Um, how do you adapt or translate those older recipes that might contain uh, things that are unfamiliar, um, you know, to, to the modern kitchen? Well, it's one of my favorite things to do, and one of the things that I feel as if I'm going to con convey history or going to transfer history and culture to the next generation. So I, I don't know if you saw in the New York Times, I did an article a few weeks ago about sautéed onions and schmaltz, goose, chicken fat, and hard-boiled eggs. And I didn't think they would even want this recipe. And they said, oh, it, sound, it, it, it sounds so nice and simple, because that's what they want. <laughs> and, and then I realized that I would put it in the, with the schmaltz. So I sauteed the onions in a lot of, but I used a little bit less uh, chicken fat. And then I tried it in um, a vegetable oil, but it was much better with chicken fat. And then I just, I did use good eggs, hard boiled eggs. And I did pretty much the original recipe. Most of the time I try to cut the amount of fat. Like if I make brisket, which I love to make, I make the brisket, I do it overnight, and then I refrigerate it, get rid of the fat, and then serve it because you really need to cook it in fat, but you don't have to have all that fat. So, uh, you know, that's one thing that I do. But I do try to modernize, but not, I don't, I think that today you don't even have to modernize it that much because when they wanted to pay me for the article, they said, well, how much were you original in that recipe? And I <laughs> thought, no, I didn't want to be original. Um, but I did add tarragon to it, which they, no self-respecting Polish uh, Jewish <laughs> cook of the last century would have used. So I said, well, I did add one ingredient. But, the th but that's what I really, I try to preserve the authenticity of the recipe, but I'm always thinking about who is going to be making the recipe. Because I, I, I guess I always think about my readers. If I like it, and, and I, I get such a charge, even to this day, I've been doing this for a long time, when I find something new, like this simple eggs and onions, which has a longer story than I wrote about. I, I found the recipe in Australia visiting the um, uh, Sydney and Melbourne Jewish community. I was there on a speaking tour. And um, I noticed that at every Friday night dinner, they had challah and really beautiful homemade challahs. And then they had three, two things, so, uh, chicken livers, um, hummus, and three dips, and then this eggs with onion. Every, every single family had a little bit of a f family variation. So I thought, here's a story for the Times, but I didn't think it was much of a story. <laughs> so then after I wrote the story, all kinds of people contacted me, Indians that had the same, I mean, yeah, Indian, not American, same Indian, right. Indian Indians, where they had the same sauteed onions and hard-boiled eggs, but with different spices. Mm. And that was a meal for them. And I realized this in Poland was a meal. And my mother remembered when she was growing up that her mother would make this for a meal. Hmm. And, but she never made it, ever, until I made it. No. I mean, so that she never, her mother never gave her recipes because her mother didn't cook. She taught her cook how to cook. But, but this was a common immigrant recipe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's right. the, I, I, and I, what I do too when I'm doing recipes, I call people like JJ <laughs> because I ask a lot of questions. And it's amazing what you find. I think we, we're tracing farina. Was it the use of farina? Okay. I, right. In a cake. Was it in a cake? Right. In the honey cake that the I did. Cake. Because a Holocaust survivor, or so, 
made a, a cake with farina inside of it, which is what a lot of the Russians are making. If you've been on 18th Street at the um, Ukrainian bakery, and there's an Azerbaijani bakery, I think, and they have this layered Russian cake. How many of you have had it? I bet you Honey cake's amazing. It's delicious. There's <laughs> not really much honey in it. Right. But it's so delicious. Yeah. And yeah, and, and I wanted to know what the origin. I can't remember that what was, we found out. I don't. I think we we didn't quite solve it, we, but we but, found some stuff. But there was something called grits that people used in Germany and in other places that was like right, farina, farina in cooking, and it was very it was comfort food. Yeah, I learned a lot about farina. So, from that, right, exactly. From that question. <laughs> I don't um, know if I answered your yeah, question. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so it's kind of on this on a similar note, and this is for Peter. Um, so, you know, your use of ingredients, I was raving to him about the dough and his pizza. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, so your use of ingredients and methods um, seem to be really crucial to your recipes, um, and especially the techniques. Uh, and so how... Um, you know, it's hard to convey techniques in a cookbook without maybe illustrations or imagery. Um, I was thinking, I don't know if anyone out there watches Schitt's Creek, um, but there's the family dinner episode when they're, uh, Moira and David are making cheese enchiladas and they're supposed to fold in the cheese. And she's like, just fold in the cheese. And he's like, what does that mean, folding in the cheese? Do I fold it like a paper? Do I, what do I do? And so I know when I'm often, doing recipes, I have to YouTube things because I have no idea what they're talking about. And so like, how did you learn techniques? Because there was no YouTube um, back when you were but a budding chef, um, you know, and I don't know how well they convey in, in cookbooks and recipes. They just say, do it, you know? Um, Is that a, yeah? So, I mean, there was Jacques Pepin back in the day, who okay. had a really great cookbook about technique. Okay. Um, lots of different ways to trust chickens and how to make roses out of tomatoes and okay. other really, really helpful things. Okay. Um, mostly it's, it's just repetition. Uh, and it's also constantly evolving. I mean, you spend a lot of time in the kitchen doing extremely mundane things over and over and over and over and over again, and it gives you a lot of time to think about it. So I have a whole methodology for peeling fava beans that's okay. super efficient. Okay. Uh, it's easy for me. So tell us, <laughs> tell us what it is, because I secrets. don't give up on fava beans. You don't want to give it's up on fava secret. beans. It's really, it's really not fun to talk. It's not interesting to talk about. But I'll tell you, you know, <laughs> after, after the show, right. we're going to have a little discussion about fava like beans. if you told me to peel a fava bean, I'd be like, what? How do I do like, I would get the, the peeler, like, the actual big, like, carrot peeler out. Well, I mean, I, I worked in a kit, fancy kitchen store in Cambridge, Massachusetts, before okay. I worked in restaurants. And one day, a woman brought her Cuisinart in that was melted on the bottom. This is a true story. And we're like, what the heck did you do? And she said, well, I was making hollandaise, and the recipe said to put it over heat. Right? <laughs> Cuisinart? She put, put the over. Cuisinart on the flame and melted it, you know, but I mean, technique is really, really hard to convey well. Right. Um, and people can take it super literally. Right. But I mean, you know, like Richard Olney is an amazing writer. When he explains how to do something, you understand how to do it. <laughs> okay. But it's a super rare gift. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I used to have a really involved squid cleaning technique that I've totally thrown out and I have a new, much better squid cleaning technique. But, you know, it involved a 30-year-old cookbook and watching Japanese guys cleaning octopus on YouTube. Um, but, you know, the yield's much better and the squid's much nicer. And it, you need something to think about because you're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again all day. Although I guess there are plenty of people, other people to do that for them. But, I mean, cooking is, that's what cooking's about. You know, if you're not interested in peeling your own garlic and chopping your own onions and cleaning your own dishes, then, you know, I don't think the love that you've put into the food is reflected in the dish in the dining room. And, you know, a lot of restaurants have beautiful food and there's just no emotion to it. 
Um, but it's, you know, it's really about being involved in, in honoring that technique, because that's what the profession's all about. And we haven't talked about cocktails, but we'll get back to cookbooks. So why vermouth and aperitivos? Um, it's another negative story, but I'm happy to <laughs> okay. share it with you. <laughs> okay. um, I was at work one day, and one of my wine salesmen came in, and he said, we got this great vermouth. You really have to try it. And I tried it, and I said, yeah, that's really nice. And he said, yeah, it's $37 a bottle. And I'm like, bullshit. I can make something better than that. So, you know, I just started playing around, but it was just really, ju you know, just yeah. because I was so pissed off about how expensive the vermouth was. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but passion fuels like... Or to anger, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Fuels a lot of things. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, pushes you. Okay, that, yeah. yeah. But, it, I mean, it, yeah, it took a long, a lot of tweaking and reworking and, you know, right. Dozens and dozens and dozens of different flavor combinations to yeah. find something that you know we're super happy with. Yeah. Um, but you know that's the fun, and that's the fun part of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I like cocktails, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. which I don't drink as many of now that the pandemic is pretending to be over. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Um, maybe I'll have some questions for Zach and Susan. Uh, so. Some of you might want to ask them this question, so, but I'm going to beat you to it, I think. Um, so, you know, the Library of Congress has over 40,000 cookbooks and countless other culinary, uh, you know, material uh, recipes that you saw upstairs, like Tom Thumb's cake, wooden cake. Um, so how did you, with all of that material, um, how did you pick the items to be in the book? Um, but also, how did you, pick, with those, that, those items you picked, um, how did you select either like the recipes or the things to highlight in the book as well? So picking, picking the book um, and then also picking the item within the book to highlight. And how do you write a one page, one paragraph thing about these books? <laughs> but either one of you can answer that one. Well, um, it was a challenge. Um, you should have seen what our conference room looked like. At one point, we had stacks of books everywhere. Zach and I spent a lot of time in the stacks. Um, there were a lot of wonderful finds that you wouldn't necessarily find in a catalog. You simply had to come across it. But we also consulted a lot of experts. We consulted people in your division. We looked at food historians, and we went through a lot of databases to find interesting material that we found really tracked American history. Mm -hmm. And so when we realized kind of the, the bounty that we have at the library, um, we realized we couldn't do a global collection of our cookbooks, that it would have to be American, okay. and that we would have to start probably in the colonial era. Mm -hmm. And um, so that led to other decisions mm -hmm. on what we could pick. Um, we spent a lot of time in the conference room looking through things and, and deciding, um, well, that is a very cool recipe, and that is something that no one's probably uh, tried in a while, or it was significant. This is a book that perhaps um, had a lot of influence and made an impact, and so let's put that in the consider pile. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was a lot of legwork, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, in terms of your second yeah. half of the question, you know, we have a cookbook, obviously we can't reproduce the whole book in our book, so what do we choose? We made a conscious effort to really try to have as much visual diversity as possible. Um, as you can see, for those of you who already have a copy and you know, we'll have more on sale later, um, we really want to have the covers of the book that are fun, colorful, surprising. We want to show individual recipes. We want to show illustrations from the collections not just cookbooks or drink books, but also movie posters, advertising, and really trying to have not just like page after page of recipe, 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 because it's not a cookbook itself, but a history of American cookbooks. And so we did have to make some tough cuts, of course, some images that kind of worked on their own, but there was nothing there besides a pretty image, some the opposite that had incredible history, but just wasn't really photogenic or due to other rights or preservation issues we couldn't include in the book. So it was a fun challenge. And what I like to say is, you know, we could have done this book again, 
and chosen a hundred different items. You know, we had to have some classics, of course, um, including a Joan Ethan, uh, Jewish Cooking in America. But several other cookbooks could have been swapped out very easily for another one. Um, so it was definitely a fun challenge. And Susan, you're responsible for the Easy Bake Oven Gourmet. Oh, the selection of the, the Easy selection Bake Oven. Easy bake yeah, that oven had to cookbook. be included <laughs> because that, well, that is such a cultural touchstone for people of a certain generation. Right. And as it turns out, a lot of people who went on to have professional careers as cooks got their start with the Easy Bake Oven. And so having the, a cookbook that was the gourmet recipes that you could make in an Easy Bake Oven was simply irresistible, yeah. you know. Uh, lobster truffle. Who knew you could yeah. put that? You could how, cook how that many, under. How many of you, by a show of hands, had an easy bake oven at some point in your life? Yeah. <laughs> so, you didn't have one. There you go. So, but so we wanted to show not just not just the things that were most important and impactful, but things that um, resonated culturally as well, and that were a lot of fun. Right. And also the Manifold Destiny one? Was that yeah, Manifold well? Destiny we had to include, which is how to cook your meal on your car engine. On your, on your way to a destination, you have this access to heat. Right. You have the time to prepare it as you're, as you're on the road. And so including the, the recipes that could be fixed on your car engine, um, that's so American, too. Yeah. That was the that's other hard. thing. That is a very American idea. Yeah. Uh, tailgating, you know, um, this idea of... The chuck wagon. This is, you know, we have a long history of vehicles and food. And so we had to explore that. We even have a food truck cookbook in the right. book. Right, food truck. Recipes you, around you, the country. Uh, try any of the manifold uh, <laughs> destiny recipes on your own? I have not tried it on my Honda just yet, but <laughs> that could be a good summer project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But t t talk about Amelia um, Simmons. Simmons? Yeah, of what, course. what you found about her, because I never knew what you pointed out in the book. Yeah, yeah, so probably the rarest item in the book, because there's only four copies left in the world, I believe, is American Cookery, um, and the library is one of the four copies. It's the first ever cookbook printed in America, written by an American. Woman. Is it from 1796? Woman. A woman, Sorry. Amelia Simmons. Not much is known about her. Um, the title page says she's an American orphan, um, but the historical record is a little spotty on exactly who she was. We know the first edition was in Hartford, Connecticut. Subsequent editions very quickly after the 1796 edition were published in New York. And what's so uh, unique about it, besides being the first and the oldest, is that she adapted um, British recipes using na native North American ingredients. So for example, molasses, and in fact, it has the first ever pumpkin pie recipe, pumpkins being, you know, squash being native to North America. She also invented the word cookie using a Dutch version of cookie. Um, she has a section on, I think, Christmas cookies and then another Christmas cookie, it says. Um, slaw, as in salad, also a Dutch transplant. Um, and again, we only, the library only has one of four copies, so we had to include that. That's front and center, I think it's like page two. <laughs> Um, and so definitely one of the treasures in the book. And she was Ill illiterate, right? She yeah, yeah, she kind of has a, you know, a, I can't be responsible for the errors because I don't quite know how to read and write. Right. <laughs> Something along those lines. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. I have another question for you guys. Sure. Um, okay, um, this, I might be stealing one of your questions as well for them. Uh, what surprised you most? Um, it could be, Related to food history, it could be an, an item itself, a cookbook or a recipe or any sort of culinary thing. Well, I can answer this in the general sense. Maybe Susan can share some specific surprises. But what I loved about working on this project um, is that every division at the Library of Congress has something related to food and drink. Um, our manuscript division has you know, handwritten recipes sent to George Washington in Thomas Jefferson's handwriting all the way kind of through the present. Um, the a Veterans History Project, and I know Susan loved this uh, topic and can talk about it more, but uh, veterans, especially POWs, wrote cookbooks while in prison. So that was a great section to include in our book. Um, you might have seen upstairs, we have the lobby card from Mr. Roberts, a 1955 film that has a scene of them making cocktails, or scotch basically, from kind of ingredients on a ship during World War II. Um, so many, you know, we had the photos of the photographs and uh, 
uh, in Prince Division. So it was a really a pleasure, really, going across the library, talking to our curators and our subject specialists, asking, what do you have, and being just so surprised at all our incredible food collection. No, I was surprised to learn about the, um, in the Veterans History Project, that we have POW cookbooks uh, from World War II. These were men who were held in Japan and in Germany. Um, it was one of the men wrote 20 years after the war why it was that these cookbooks developed and that they were something of a phenomenon. Um, all they could think about, of course, was food while they were in prison that, on these very scanty diets. But what they would do is a lot of these allies were from all around the world. And so they found that they would collect recipes from non-Americans to find out that they wanted to try these recipes when they got home if they survived. And they, so you see a lot of international recipes taken down by our servicemen. But they were also inventing recipes. All they could think about was food. And so they were coming up with things. And one of the men said, every guy in my camp thought that he was this master chef, you know? And he's in, they're inventing these recipes. And he said, for the most part, when we got home and we tried them, they were terrible, you know? They were just, um, but they were also writing down recipes based on what they could make using the Red Cross boxes that were being delivered to prisoners. And in Japan, delivery was not frequent. But in Germany, it was. And so what can you make with uh, a candy bar and some cheese and some powdered milk? And they found ways. And we have them listing what they are going to make out of these, um, out of these boxes, including cake. They were going to make a cake. So it was, it was absolutely fascinating to come across these, these uh, cookbooks, how they're occupying the men's time as they work through their favorite recipes from childhood and begin to record all of them. It's a wonderful collection to explore, and it also says a lot about the American experience. And again, that was something we wanted to come through in the book. But that's, that's something I absolutely loved going through and researching. It was, it was a wonderful find. We could have done a whole book just on that, frankly, <laughs> um, that topic, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm thinking we should open up to questions from the audience, and we have a microphone uh, runner, so if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. What's the grossest thing that you found in any cookbook? <laughs> oh, um, the one that we liked, that we thought was pretty gross that we included the frosted ham. Uh, that cookbook had something like 18 ways of making uh, sugar icing and how you just slathered this sugar over the ham. And we have a, we have a great image of it in there too. Um, no, that, that was a popular choice in the office for grossest, grossest for sure. item. That was by uh, Fanny Farmer, if you ever heard of her, the Boston School. Um, uh, cooking, yeah. So that, that was that was probably number one. There also was in the section on uh, the FDR White House. Um, the food in the FDR White House was not very good, in part because it was the Great Depression, and Eleanor Roosevelt wanted to set an example for the nation. Um, so there's this great quote from Ernest Hemingway that I'm not going to quite remember fully, but it's something like, uh, he went to a dinner at the White House and said we had um, rainwater soup, wilted salad, and a cake from a very enthusiastic but not very good baker. <laughs> um, something along those lines. And so one of the recipes in the collection was, I think, a pineapple cream cheese jello salad, something like that. So that, that was up there. Not, not quite frosted ham, but close second. All right, so more questions. A comment and then a question. With the cookbook, it's really important to know the little little things you do to make sure it works that you forget to write down or tell somebody. So when you say there's a well-written cookbook, that would be it. The question I have is, so how much do you charge for your vermouth now? How, oh, can you repeat? How much do you charge for your vermouth now? For vermouth. Um, like retail? I don't know. I think it's... Uh, 27 bucks, maybe, something like that, <laughs> wow. of which I get very little. <laughs> um, I'm just curious, uh, thinking back to my 
early childhood, the various um, dishes created from jello were very, uh, very popular and in all sorts. Were those invented by the Jell-O company, and were there any other companies that sort of invented products, of recipes for their products? <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, the use of gelatin predates Jell-O, right? That's true. I would think. And it was an early cocktail thing, too, um, you know, from whatever, the 20s or something. There were places you'd go to get your Jell-O cocktail um, before Jell-O shots. Before Knox I, I think there was yeah. gelatin with a G before Jell-O with a J. Right. But when it became popular, it really became popular. And uh, what was the book? Um, what's her name? Oh, gosh. There was a, there's a book, what? There's a book yeah. just on, Gel on, on gelatin. But it was, what was really good about it was that it was quivery. You could make it in advance. Um, strawberries or whatever you put into it would hold. And it was just very popular and kind of new rather than, you know, fresh, good food. And that's... It just sort of marked a period, sort of the turn of the century and later in history. Yeah, and I think it felt modern in a way. You know, it's, it's the rough era of um, supermarkets are now a thing. Look at all this convenience in life and this crazy colorful oh, yeah. food. Yeah. It was called, the book was called Perfection Salad. That was jelly. Rather than like, uh, I don't know, lettuce that crumb, you know, crushes and spoils. I mean, my... Grandmother made a thing with lady fingers soaked in black raspberry jello with a can of fruit cup and bananas, and it was delicious. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that's a happy, happy food memory from, from my childhood. Yeah. My grandmother also made jello with fruit in it. This and is that the, yeah. Is my happy, a very happy memory for me. Well, my mother learned a shrimp dish that you had in jello, and then she. Use gefilte fish instead. With oh my gosh! <laughs> that doesn't sound right. And beets. I'm sorry, but that sounds worse than the ham. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Manischewitz gefilte fish that she would put in. Oh goodness! And more. I yep. think it's my turn. Yeah. Um, earlier, you said there were recipes or stories that didn't make the book. I'm curious if there is a recipe or a story from American history that keeps you up at night that you wish you could have put in the book. That sort of keeps me up at night, but probably the coolest book that we just couldn't quite make work is a book called The Best from the Bottle. And it's a very simple drinks recipe book from the 70s. But what's unique about it is that it is designed as a 3D version of a liquor bottle. So it's kind of like a, um, you know, kind of like a binder. It has the rings that kind of like flip through, but the front and back of it is a bottle and it comes in a little box here at the library. But it just, there's nothing much to say besides, hey, here's a cool looking item. And the rights were kind of a tricky situation. We here at the library take copyright very seriously. We always clear permissions. And it was four authors and a, two different designers and who do you get the rights and it was 50 years ago. And, and maybe we could have done a fair use argument, but we decided didn't quite make, make the cut. So that, that's my choice. Do you have one? I got all the stuff I wanted in that book. <laughs> Darn you. I know I got something in the book, Yes, you too. did. <laughs> um, what Mrs. Fisher knows about Southern cooking, uh, the Rare Books has it upstairs on display. Um, but I know I, I, I was like, this has to be in the book. This has to be in the book. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and I guess one another additional answer is, there's a lot of videos here at the library of even obscure cocktail ads to Sex in the City, Cosmopolitans, and obviously you can't really translate a video into a 2D book. And we tried, but it just, it, the, the image quality didn't quite work. So we had a few representatives of film, and Susan had a great feature on cocktails in the movies, but we couldn't, you know, it would have been great to somehow, you know, insert a CD or a DVD into every book, but no one has DVD players, so that wouldn't have worked. You speak about um, what you learned about the history of cocktail making in America, especially how, how did drinks get named and is there some international authority that uh, 
says this is the first uh, martini or the first Manhattan or the first old fashioned or whatever? I, that's a great question. Um, cocktails often enter into um, society, if you will, via you know myth and legend, and you know this bar claims who invented this and that. Um, there is a official organization. I'm gonna not quite sure of the name, maybe the International Bartenders Association, something like that. And they have a list of about 75 official cocktails, um, Manhattan, Martini, that kind of thing. But something as simple as, say, a gin and tonic is not going to be on the list because that's not necessarily a unique one. Um, and, you know, so it, it, the history of American cocktails certainly changes and shifts in patterns. Originally, a cocktail was a very specific type of drink made of sugar, spirit, water, and bitters. That's the first definition of a cocktail from 1806, worldwide. Uh, an American newspaper published it. Um, and I, I, I love the uh, follow-up quote. It was in a uh, Federalist newspaper, if you know your early republic history. And the editor, highly partisan, wrote something along the lines of, um, another definition of a cocktail is that it's said to help, um, help someone swallow because a, a Democratic candidate, after drinking it, will swallow anything. <laughs> Something like along those lines. And I'm butchering the quote, but um, it's, it's certainly changed over time, and uh, that original recipe is what we kind of call an old-fashioned today, very similar to an old-fashioned. I would say it's, um, we have a lot of, oh yeah, it's right. We need questions from the audience. Go. Hi. Um, what are some of the most surprising recipe origin stories from the book? Like, you saw this and you were like, wow, I would have never thought this came from that. I would have to give that a little bit of thought because I didn't really think that way. <laughs> um, what, I, what I was especially interested in was, was how these recipes and these cookbooks were reflecting what was happening at the time, and that there's a lot of interesting evolution. And so maybe partly to address your question, um, for example, with the jambalaya, which we were just talking, I just about, to say that. Just Thank talking you. about that, um, that what, we're, what you start to see here is a very basic uh, recipe that is kind of the standard that comes out around 1877. And then next thing you know, you're seeing it turned into um, a, uh, uh, well, we actually, we actually do have the, um, a kosher jambalaya recipe. And um, so you do start to see how some of these uh, recipes develop that we were able to show you the first printed version, say, of jambalaya. But then we're able also to show you several other versions that come along later over the years where suddenly jambalaya is going from a chicken recipe to one that's got sausage to one that's got endless spices. Um, that was kind of a fun thing to actually track, you know, to see that happen. Um, I'm not sure that that answers your question exactly, but um, yes, that sort of thing is, is kind of fun to follow. And, and yeah, that's a great answer. Um, jambalaya probably is what I would have said, but a similar answer is um, we have a, a section early on about how Thomas Jefferson is often credited with bringing macaroni to America or ice cream or other culinary treats from Europe. But one thing that is often lost in the story is that he was not the one doing the cooking. But there's a quote that the only time someone ever saw him in the kitchen of Monticello was to fix a clock. Um, instead, it was, in, it, it was his enslaved chef, um, James Hemings, who did the cooking. When Jefferson was in Paris, he had his enslaved chef, James Hemings, um, train with the, um, uh, a, a prince of France's personal chef. And so Hemings was the one who brought back these recipes and cooked them. Of course, if you recognize that last name, James Hemings, he was the brother of Sally Hemings, who in turn was the, technically the sister-in-law, is that right, of, no. Half-sister, thank you, yeah, of, of his wife. So it's very complicated family history there. Um, but that's one way you know, that's surprising in some ways the origin of a recipe. And you talk about origin stories of, of macaroni and cheese. I, I always thought it was Thomas Jefferson that transferred something like um, 
you know, the baked macaroni with cheese that, you, that he learned about in, in Italy, but it wasn't. It was James Hemings, because if you ever go to a southern, um, a, a, you know, a, a family reunion, they always have this macaroni and cheese, but not, you know, not the craft macaroni and cheese. <laughs> yeah but really good macaroni and cheese. And it occurred to me that it's been a tradition forever. You know, you don't get it necessarily in the North. Yeah. And, but you get it, and it must have come from James Hemings, so we've all Great got connection. history wrong. Yeah, absolutely. We actually have a book in there from, I think, 1991 or so called The Black Family Reunion Cookbook. Right. That was put out by the... Um, uh, National Council for Negro Women, I believe. Is the oh, name. Does it have macaroni and cheese I, in it? Absolutely, absolutely. See, that's really interesting. I, I mean, I just realized it yeah. when I went to a black reun family reunion, and I thought, wait a second, this isn't... Anyway, but he learned about it in Italy because he was with him in Italy. I, I, uh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to thank you for sharing your insights today. And I had two questions. I think one more geared towards the authors and then one towards the chefs. Um, for the authors, I was kind of thinking about when you were doing the research, you really saw sort of like the whole sort of cycle of foods and how they've evolved. And I was interested in seeing, you know, like what is old is new and what is new is old. What, when you were researching, did you kind of see like, oh, that's a food trend that's really coming back up right now that we had like originated back a long time ago? Um, and then for the, the chefs, I noticed Peter earlier mentioned he had some cookbooks that he keeps rereading or some things that are like go-tos for you. Like what is your sort of go-to cookbook or your go-to influence, your favorite uh, meal or ingredient that you just sort of always keep coming back to and, and sort of relying upon? Can I go first so I won't forget the question? Sure. Go for it. Um, I guess go-to somewhat cookbook is Honey from a Weed by Patience Gray, which is memoir, recipe, lots of descriptions of ingredients um, from Italy and Spain and a little bit in Greece as well. Um, my go-to ingredient would be anchovies, um, which is spoken a, lo a lot in, in her book as well, but, you know, we spend a few hours a day at work just, you know, cleaning anchovies. Um, so, and, you know, it's a great all-around food. It's an umami food, wonderful texture, really great at enhancing other flavors, and just absolutely perfect on its own. So that's, like, my go-to thing. Something I just learned today, speaking of that, I learned upstairs at our display, which I hope many of you uh, checked out, is that the first ever description of anchovy pizza, either in English or by an American, I can't quite remember which, but anchovies on pizza was in the 1830s by Samuel Morse, who invented the telegraph. There you go. I have no idea. The Library yeah. of Congress knew, I guess. Um, addressing your question about trends, what's old is new again, when you look at the early recipes in our book, of course, this is all natural, all natural ingredients. And then we take you through into the 20th century with all of this mass processed, mass Hello. produced jello. Jello makes an appearance. But then, you know, by the time you're getting into the late 60s and early 70s, we're featuring uh, vegetarian books and uh, vegan books. And there is this, there is, again, there's this return to what is natural. And so you absolutely do see some of these things cycle through. Yeah, no, that's, thank you. A great example of that of an early kind of farm to table, if you will, moment, though they don't call it that, is in a community cookbook. And real quick, community cookbooks, which the Library of Congress has, I think, over 6,000, if not more. Um, these are local churches, civic organizations, libraries, um, and then into the present synagogues too, um, raising funds for their local communities by compiling recipes of local, often women, um, sometimes men, more recently, but anyhow, from one book from Kentucky, they literally have a pickled walnut recipe, and they say it's best to pick the walnuts around the 7th of June. They're that specific, thinking about local ingredients, so you can't get more hyper-local than a specific day of the year. I've or more natural, walnut. yeah. It's but very they're doing that in May now. Mm -hmm. oh, right, yeah. <laughs> Maybe in February, yeah. One more question. Oh, but you didn't answer. Oh, sorry. 
Yes. In uh, preparing this book or thinking about what was going to be included or not, um, did you identify any regions in the United States that surprised you in terms of like the complexity of the meals that they were making at the time? Um, outside of maybe, let's say, New York or, you know, the Connecticut that you mentioned, other cities or towns that really perplex you? As, as a West Coast person, I was pretty aware of that, <laughs> that, that it, it never, not everything happens in New York. Um, and, and a book that I really especially liked was, um, it was the first Mexican cookbook to uh, get a general readership, you know, and it was available just, you know, outside of, of, of New Mexico. And it was the, the state librarian was a Hispanic woman who compiled a lot of these recipes that Americans were seeing for the first time outside of the Southwest. And we, um, we then, and, and that's pretty early, that's 1934. And we've also included then um, different, you know, as different waves of, of groups came in and they're bringing their traditions and we're starting to see Amer um, Americans who've been here for generations adapting to it or being inspired by it or, or just get, you know. Um, and so that was a fun thing was to look at, for me, the Southwest and the West Coast. Um, you know, there is a lot of the South is represented because the South is known for their cooking and they produced a lot of cookbooks. But we, we definitely tried to get out of a couple of those areas and, 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 and look at what was being done as early as possible. That was an important thing too. Um, what is the first time that we're starting to see some of these books appear? And one of the earliest Mexican cookbooks that I could find in English was, was from the 30s. Mm -hmm. So do you want me to? Yeah, oh. are we, wrap, we have no more questions. We're wrapping up. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for uh, your attention um, and your questions. And hopefully we'll have some more food discussions. <laughs> um, I know I'm into it. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to have a book signing. Um, is it back there? Uh, book signing back there. Um, we have American Feast, but we also have a couple of uh, Joe Nathan's books as well for sale. Um, so yes, that is it.